Hey everybody, and welcome to my festive tech calendar session. My session today is going to be on app delivery for cloud PC. So without further ado, here's that session. And rather than subject you to seeing my face throughout the session, I figured I was just going to do this intro and then just simply have my slides and my demos. I hope you all enjoy and happy holidays. To start off, just a little bit of housekeeping. I assume you're watching this on YouTube, particularly if you're watching it live. Maybe after the fact, it's embedded on my website or something like that. And if that is the case, be sure to go to the Festive Tech Calendar YouTube channel to check out the rest of the awesome sessions. If you're tweeting while watching this session or any of the sessions, please use the hashtag, hashtag Festive Tech Calendar. And also, if you happen to find this on my site, be sure to go over to festivetechcalendar.com to find out more about this awesome event. And if you could be charitable during this festive season, that'd be excellent. And you could support the events charity of choice, Girls Who Code. It's a really excellent charity and obviously right in our wheelhouse working in the tech base. A little bit about me. My name is Rory Monahan, as I've said. I'm from a small place called Galway, which is located in the west of Ireland. I blog over at RoryMon.com and work in technical marketing at ControlUp. If you'd like to follow me on Twitter, you can. That's at RoryMon. Lastly, I host a weekly podcast that covers my highlights from the week's Enterprise IT news, and I do it every single week. And I highlight some really great community content like different scripts, tricks, and tips. From time to time, I'll highlight an awesome remote work opportunity and more. On the topic of the Five Bytes podcast, I'm delighted to announce that my podcast is an official supporter of the Festive Tech Calendar. I am running a competition associated with the event with one lucky winner set to win a Raspberry Pi 4 and an Elgato Stream Deck. So I put on Twitter, again, at Rory Mon, I put a poll up on Twitter asking what people wanted to win. And by mistake, I put Nintendo Wii instead of Nintendo Switch. So <laughs> I might have skewed the results with that mistake. But I was going to give away either a Nintendo Switch, an Elgato Stream Deck, a Lemetric Time, or a PlayStation 5. I was really surprised. Not that many people chose the PlayStation 5. But the overwhelming majority selected the Elgato Stream Deck. And I figured, well, you know, it's a lot cheaper than the PS5. How about I round it up? by also throwing in a Raspberry Pi 4. I feel these are really awesome prizes for techies because even if you already have an Elgato Stream Deck, you probably have multiple machines. Why not have another one for your second or third machine? And they do work on Mac OS and Windows too. So to be in with a chance to win, go to 5bytespodcast.com and you'll find a link right at the top of the episode guide that leads to instructions and ways to enter. The competition closes on December 31st, so if you're watching this after December 31st, sorry, better luck next year. Of course, I'm not the only supporter. Avanad Octopus Deploy and my own employer ControlUp, among others, are also doing their own giveaways with prizes ranging from Lego sets to this cool Bose speaker that you can see on this slide, which is the prize that ControlUp is offering. So be sure to go to festivetechcalendar.com slash home slash supporters to find out how you can win and to enter for these giveaways. Just a quick synopsis of what we will cover in today's session. We'll go through Microsoft Endpoint Manager application delivery, the different app types that could be deployed, or at least the ones that I feel are relevant to Windows 365. We'll go through Windows 365, which comes in a business SKU and an enterprise SKU. We'll talk a little bit about the intricacies of the Windows 365 SKUs, what will work today for both SKUs, what only works for one SKU, and what we might expect in the future for both SKUs. I said SKUs a lot. After discussing ways to deploy applications to the desktops with MEM, we will contemplate just putting all of the apps into the image and calling it a day. You know, the quick, dirty, easy, lazy way of doing things and what that could mean. And then we will dive into several demos, which I'm sure is what everyone wants rather than slides. So don't worry, there will be plenty of demos. But let's get rocking. 
With Windows 365 Cloud PC Enterprise, Microsoft Endpoint Manager is supported. You can use this for setting policies, deploying custom images, configuring your VNets to allow access to your other resources in Azure or on-prem, and more, but importantly for this session, you could deploy applications to your Windows 365 devices. The great thing about MEM is that it is a cloud service. You just go to endpoint.microsoft.com, have your MDM authority assigned, and devices enrolled, and Santa's your uncle, you can start to manage the devices and deploy your applications. In this screenshot, you can see an example of two applications that I deployed to my cloud PC, MSI X Hero, which is an MSI X application, and XML Notepad 2007, a really old one, that's a very simple MSI. And I've got some other examples in there, but let's go through them, and then I'll show you more during the demo. So there's a long list of types of package types and devices you could deploy with and to. Right now, Windows 365 Cloud PC is Windows only. So we won't go through all of these options, but let's focus on some of the more Windows-centric ones that you may use with Windows 365. So you could deploy a Microsoft Store app using the App Store URL. To do this, simply find an application that you want to deploy that's in the store, grab the URL from your browser, and then step through the steps in Microsoft Endpoint Manager. Since the store is pretty limited in quality apps, I'm not sure how often you will use this type of deployment. I guess if Microsoft are successful in turning it around and getting large adoption of the store by developers, this could become more useful. I also, I believe that they're pulling support or ending the store for business. So I'm guessing it's going to rely wholly on the adoption by developers of the actual public facing Microsoft store. You can also add Microsoft 365 apps. If you're using one of Microsoft's base Windows 365 images, as the name implies, it is a 365 service. You have to have a valid 365 account to consume the service, so the base set of 365 apps are already included in that base image. So really, you don't have to do it this way, but you could. And you can also select some additional components like Visio and Project Plus, as well as set the frequency of updates. And since Windows 365 is persistent, it should act as a means of managing the 365 apps, which can be good. Again, Windows 365, we'll talk a little bit more about it and what makes up Windows 365, what are the characteristics. But as it's persistent, it's like patching and maintaining a physical endpoint in the office. You image it once and you might not have to re-image it again for years. So being able to manage the updates and the update cadence on this persistent machine is going to be pretty useful for you. And you can do that with the 365 apps here. There's also an option for managing the Edge browser. You could select whether to go with stable, dev, or beta if you care about that. I guess useful, particular for Windows 365 right now, as it doesn't seem to provide a native feature for detecting your local region, would be the ability to choose the language here. If you did want to deploy the dev browser to maybe just a subset of IT workers in your environment, you could do that with just the Azure AD group. Just provision this application and select a specific group when doing the assignments part. If you'd like to, you can add an application that is just a web link. This is another one I'm not too sure will be used all that often, but hey, it's a nice to have. Now getting into what I guess will be the most commonly used options within Microsoft Endpoint Manager for application delivery, starting with the line of business applications. This is an option to add a custom or in-house application by uploading from various package types. That includes things like Android, APK, iOS, IPA, and macOS .intune Mac package types, which I'm not gonna talk about because this is Windows 365 and it's Windows only. But for Windows, you could deploy MSI, AppX, AppX Bundle, MSIX, and MSIX Bundle package types. In this screenshot on the slide, I deployed the enterprise Google Chrome browser using the MSI. It is very easy to deploy an MSI or MSIX. MSI is also obviously very common in enterprise already. So if you are an SCCM or MECM admin today and you haven't used Intune or MEM yet, 
you may be struck by how limited the options are on this screen that you see in front of you. And you'd be absolutely right. But you will see if you choose a Win32 app instead, though it requires you to upload an Intune Win file, along the top you can see that you have many more options and some of those options you'll be more familiar with if you used SCCM in the past. Now the Intune Win file is merely a wrapper for your existing package, be it an EXE or an MSI. You can convert your existing package with the Microsoft Win32 content prep tool and then simply upload the outputted into a win file. And you can see a quick example here. This is me running the win32 content prep tool. Very easy to do. Just point to a source folder, uh, point to the setup file for your application package, and then also where you want it to be outputted to. Mem is pretty good at parsing out the package metadata and then just filling it in within many of the remaining fields that are required for the deployment. And like I said, you will see throughout the remaining steps, which is the screenshot, the white bar along the top, that you have a lot of those different features that you might be used to from SCCM or Microsoft Endpoint Configuration Manager. And just comparing some of the package options when deploying with an Intune Win32 package type, you could see some of the features like detection rules, dependencies, supersedence, and more are available, as well as being able to control toast notifications for users, greater control over the install schedule, reboot handling, and optimizing the delivery to improve the user experience and make it as least disruptive as possible. So again, a lot of those abilities that you'd be familiar with with SCCM already. Whereas along the bottom, the line of business app type, which you may remember, uh, that was my Google Chrome Enterprise a few screenshots ago. Well, this gives you very few options. You can filter to exclude certain machines from getting the install, and really that's about it. Clearly, the Intune Win package type is the way to go, right? Well, it is and it isn't. If you have a lot of packages ready to go as MSI and EXE, you should be able to pretty easily script conversion to Intune Win, but there is still obviously that conversion process that has to happen and then subsequent testing effort required too and possible remediation. So still a little bit of a hill to climb. And just talking about MEM in general, Microsoft Endpoint Manager, it is pretty slow when deploying applications. You can expect it to take 15 plus minutes until an application installs on a device. I've seen it take over 30 minutes. I suspect the larger the installer, the longer it will take. I haven't tried something like say maybe Spec Builder that is over six gigs in size, but for that it could perhaps take over an hour, just guesstimating here. The good news though is if you used SECM in the past, you may be used to how long that took at processing publishing applications. And when it comes to just the publishing or processing of the applications, MEM is a bit quicker. So in this bullet point, I specifically call out new deployments. So if you're uploading a package and deploying it for the first time, you can expect it could take quite a while until it actually installs on the devices that you've assigned it to. But if you've added your applications before and they've been available for a while, you should see the apps start to install within a minute of a new device being enrolled or within a minute of the refresh interval being hit on a device. So it's not quite as slow as SCCM or MECM in the past. So here's one of those intricacies I talked about with the Windows 365, but there is currently no support for using MEM on the Windows 365 business SKU, and we'll talk a little bit about that more on the next slide. With MEM, your applications will likely be locally installed applications that can potentially conflict with other apps or cause problems to the desktop unless you are using something like MSIX, which unfortunately, as of this recording, has a relatively low success rate, making it difficult to work with for now. So I think if you check out Tim Mangan, who's the godfather of AbbV and who has dived right in on MSIX and has created some really great tools for helping ease some of that pain when packaging and converting to MSIX, I think he said that 
The typical success rate is about 40% of your applications converting to MSIX successfully, and he can get it up to 60% applying some fixes. But will the normal IT pro be willing to go through that struggle? I'm not so sure. As of this recording, there is no support in MEM for MSIX App Attach. And MSIX App Attach is a little bit of a struggle with Windows 365 in general due to some of its current limitations anyway. And maybe just to take a quick step back, because if you're brand new to Windows 365 Cloud PC, you may have been surprised when I said that MEM is not supported for the business SKU. Let me do a quick fire explanation about some of the important differences and intricacies between enterprise and business. Let's start with enterprise. The way it was positioned at launch was that it is suitable for an unlimited number of users with 300 plus users touted. I have two friends working on different Windows 365 projects right now. I think both are actually less than 300 users, but they've still opted for enterprise due to some of the challenges with the business SKU desktop that we will talk about when going through that SKU. For enterprise, currently some form of Active Directory is required. There's an asterisk there because at Ignite, it was announced that Azure Active Directory join is coming to Windows 365 Enterprise. They announced a public preview that will be coming soon, but at least as of this recording, the preview has not kicked off yet. Now this is going to be broadcast on December 5th, so maybe it will be out by then, I'm not sure. The preview, that is. With Enterprise, you can use Microsoft Endpoint Manager for deploying the desktops, policies, managing the antivirus, and deploying applications. Now, that is all dependent on having the right licensing. So you need to have your E5 license at least for setting the MDM authority to Intune. In MEM for Enterprise, Endpoint Analytics reports are also available, though somewhat limited at this time and you also require to have at least 10 desktops enrolled to leverage that feature. With Enterprise, you could select Windows 10 or Windows 11. On the business desktop, it is being pitched for up to 300 users, so the smaller scale. It is Azure Active Directory only, which makes it quite challenging for application deployments. So if you're relying on a deployment tool today that feeds into your local Active Directory, business may be out for you. Although, during my demos, I'm going to be showing some deployment methods that will work for business and enterprise. MEM is currently not officially supported, as I've said. If you're rocking the business desktop, you can enroll it in MEM, but you won't see the Windows 365 menu right now as it doesn't work. And during my demo, I'm going to be using a business desktop that is Azure AD only. It's not connected back to my on-prem. It's not connected to any servers running within my Azure tenant. So the methods I'll be using will work on either. Business is currently Windows 10 only, though they did mention at Ignite that Windows 11 for business should be available soon. Again, not available yet at the time of this recording. So with the lack of Microsoft Endpoint Manager support, when you provision desktops, the users unfortunately are admins, which is a bit of a nightmare, and it is just a base Windows 10 image provided by Microsoft. It's not all that secure, and it's essentially unmanaged. So how are you going to manage this beast right now? So as stated, the good news for those rocking enterprise today is that Azure Active Directory join is coming to preview soon. And the good news for those rocking the business desktop is that Microsoft has suggested that Windows 365 Business will be getting MEM support soon too. Also, Scott Manchester showed off an upcoming feature to select whether a user being provisioned a business desktop is an admin or a standard user. Now again, as of this recording, when you provision a business desktop, they always end up as an admin by default, which is a nightmare. You're gonna have to provision the desktop and then try and get the toothpaste back in the tube, unfortunately. 
I did a session at the AVD user group in the United Kingdom and also a session at the AVD Winter Fest event where I talked a little bit about how you can manage that after the desktop comes up. So check those out if you'd like to find out more about that. It helps you to secure the desktop after the fact. So with all that covered about using Microsoft Endpoint Manager and all the different application types you can deploy, there is another way, and it's a somewhat dated practice, but you could just install everything, all your applications that the company owns into the image. And since Microsoft bought FSLogix, this actually works better than ever since you can just use the app masking feature to hide any applications that certain users shouldn't have access to, maybe because they don't have a valid license. And assuming that business will get image management features soon, this could work for business and enterprise in future. But, and of course there's going to be a but, this would be a silly approach in my opinion. Yes, this is an easy way out for some. I've worked for an insurance company in the past who did this in their Citrix environment. They also had a pretty fat desktop image for physical endpoints too. And I just spoke last week with a vendor who is a Microsoft Azure Virtual Desktop partner who had a customer using Citrix PVS currently in their existing environment who had images about 400 gigs in size, multiple images of different types of operating systems, each over 400 gigs. Crazy. Just because you can do something doesn't mean you should. So if we check out the pricing, and by the way, look at that. It looks like the Windows 365 trials have hit capacity again. I think that's the second time that's happened. But if we look at the pricing just under the business, you get an idea of as you scale up in terms of specs, it obviously gets much more expensive. So if you're looking at, say, that scenario I talked about, that customer with 400 gig plus images, you know, you're going to have to leave some space in there for, you know, if they're persistent machines, there's no profile management, what's being stored, the user data and the application runtime data, that's getting stored on the desktop as well. So you're going to need some room in order for that to be able to rid into the desktop. So you're going to be looking easily. The only real option for that is going to be the 512 gigs of storage, which right now you're looking at about $162 per user per month. That's business. And under enterprise, it looks like it's $158 per user per month. So pretty pricey. But I mean, even if you look uh, some lower, like 128 gigs of storage, that's not cheap either. <laughs> so you really need to be smart with how you approach this. I once had a VMware Horizon desktop user who managed to crash their machine to the point they couldn't log in anymore because their OneNote cache was about 50 gigs in size. So this kind of stuff is more common than you might think. If you're only managing physical endpoints today, you may not hit these limitations as often and know about them. And since Windows 365 is somewhat being pitched to you, because you're able to use these existing tools and existing methodology to manage them, just be aware that there's some things that maybe you do today that you really don't want to do in the future. So if you currently keep a fat desktop image, this has the potential to cost you in the long run. If you're considering Windows 365, my suggestion is to start again and take an approach with the applications being dynamically delivered in rather than being part of the image. If you're looking at Azure Virtual Desktop, the same rule applies. In fact, if you're considering any modern cloud platform desktop as a service, you can expect a hefty price tag if you try to wedge in a massive desktop image. So just don't do it. I strongly advise against deploying most of your applications with Microsoft Endpoint Manager as MSIs or EXEs are Intune Win packages too. It, well, that is assuming the Intune Win packages are just wrapping MSIs or EXEs. I wouldn't say don't do it entirely. I personally would just pick and choose which applications to deliver in that way. I suggest dynamically delivering applications. So let's get to the demos. To start this demo, I'm just going to go to my Microsoft Endpoint Manager and under all applications, you can see those various different application types that I showed in my slide deck earlier. 
But let's maybe just take a note of some of them, like XML Notepad 2007, you can see there, Master Packager. I also have MSIX Hero, that's an MSIX application. I'm gonna go over to my Cloud PC, the business desktop, and you can see that I've got my Master Packager application here. I've got my XML Notepad 2007. I've got several other applications here and you can just trust me that they were installed with Microsoft Endpoint Manager. That's not really the significance of what I wanna show you. I just want you to note that they are there on this machine. I'm gonna go into my Windows terminal. So during the slide deck, I mentioned that right now, by default, you're an admin when you provision these business desktops. So I had the app installer deployed to my machine, which gives me Windows Package Manager, and I can run commandlets from Windows PowerShell. So for example, I run winget search VS code, and I can see that there's an available package within Windows Package Manager for Visual Studio Code. And it looks like it's got a moniker for VS code. So I can just simply run a commandlet winget install VS code. And it's gonna go out there, grab the package and run the installer. Now you see this one is pretty slick, it's pretty smooth. It's just doing the install, no problem. And it's completed. And if I go, I could see that it's recently added, launch it, it opens, it functions, it works great. Now there is a but here. So let me show you this really, really cool commandlet. It's winget upgrade all. Oh, actually. There's a typo. You can see from the help above, it should be dash dash all. So I'll just fix that and run it again. But what this is doing, it's not just going to upgrade applications that I installed with Winget. It's actually going to look at the applications installed on my machine. It's going to verify if they're available within Windows Package Manager. And because I'm selecting to upgrade all, if it is in Windows Package Manager and there's a newer version, it's actually going to install the most current version available within the WinGet repo. But here's the but here. Did you see that? It threw up a prompt because the installer required elevation for Office 365 there. And similarly, master packager prompted too. So it's fine on the business desktop right now because I am an admin, as I talked about during the slides, but for a standard user, it's probably not gonna work so good. But what I do like Windows Package Manager for is for helping to feed in my automation process for packaging, and also you can use it for deploying within MEM too. So for this quick demo, I wanna show you a different product, and this one's called Turbo.net. And if you go to Turbo.net, they've got this really great hub full of applications that's already pre-packaged or pre-containerized and you can just add them to your own private repository. So if I've got it here added to my dashboard, I can run it in the cloud using HTML5, run it locally on my PC, or also just run it in the cloud windowed. I can also go in here and change some options. It is a container. I can have it run fully isolated or with less isolation. But what I wanna show you that's really cool is it's got its own dedicated virtual network stack. So you can actually change the isolation on the network too. So let's find a good example that I can show you here using that isolated network stack. So if I go to browsers, you could see they've got every major version of Internet Explorer that's ever been released. They've got so many different versions of Google Chrome, Mozilla Firefox, Opera, any browser you could want really. And if I click on Google Chrome, you can see they've also got some runtime containers that you can layer in, but also these prepackaged or predefined networking rules. So they've got an example of a command here. So I'm just gonna copy this command so I can use this network rule in particular. So you can see I actually recorded this demo quite some time ago, but it still works. One of the benefits of having a pre-recorded session. So I'm just gonna to go to my command window here. I've got my turbo.net plugin already installed on the machine. So when I run the command, it's going to hopefully pop up. There we go. The command window, and it doesn't really look anything special, right? It just looks like it opened a new command window. 
but you can see it's prefixed with the name of the network rule that I selected. And if I just maybe do a change directory within here and maybe go to C program files and basically to the Google Chrome install directory and hit enter and then do dir, we should see that Google Chrome does exist in the context of this container space that the command windows open into. So what I'm going to do is obviously, you know, a container that opens up cmd.exe that has Google Chrome available in it isn't going to be all that useful to users. So I'm going to close out of this container and I'm going to take the container ID that you can find here and I'm going to go ahead and commit this to an image so I can reuse it and this time I'm going to have it launched to Google Chrome so I can have users just launch it and get the Chrome browser containerized with the network rule. So I'm going to turbo commit the container ID that I showed you and just copied. I'm going to give it a name Chrome No Nudes because I'm blocking adult content with the network rules. And I'm also going to set the startup file. So this is going to be the behavior. This is going to be what it launches. It's not going to be that cmd.exe. I want it to launch Google Chrome. So I'm going to give it the full path to the chrome.exe and that should be good. So if you hit enter, we should see that it's going to take those images that were already available and that I used to run the container there, the block adult roots. It's using that latest Chrome image that was the latest at the time when I recorded this originally. And it's going to merge them together and commit them into my image. So if I had actually made a change in that command window, maybe I launched the Chrome browser from the command window and maybe changed the default home page or made some sort of change, that also would be merged in here into my completed image to this Chrome No Nudes image. Okay, we can see that the commit is complete. So with a image already readily available here, I could do a few things with it. So I could run a command that's turbo new and use the Chrome no nudes name. And that will spin up a brand new container instance using that image. So this time you can't see that it's bringing in Chrome. It's not bringing in the actual network rules because they were all merged into this image, but it is spinning up a brand new instance and brand new container. And if I run this container, I should be able to browse to non-nefarious sites like my own website here, say rorymon.com. I could go to the awesome zenappblog.com, another really great community resource. Check out the virtual expo, which is where I recorded this session for originally. And if I go into the help about we could see that it was that latest version of Chrome. So it just verifies that it is that Chrome that was available in that image. Now, if I tried to go to a not so appropriate website, pornhub.com, it's blocked. So it's a good thing that I recorded this session back in September and didn't try to do this one live because if that did not work, that could have gone very wrong. But I could also then, you know, actually make this available to my users. I could push it up to my own personal Turbo.net repository. I could make it available and share it across the repository. So my users could just log into Turbo.net and get that application from there. I could even export it into a virtual machine format package and then just output it as an MSI or an EXE, a portable EXE. So very flexible and would work great for Windows 365. In this quick demo, I'm going to show you using Numescent Cloud Paging Content Delivery Network for deploying and using applications on a virtual desktop host in Azure. That could be Azure Virtual Desktop or Windows 365 Cloud PC. I'm going to start by going to the Content Delivery Network and just logging in. Here, I could have all of my applications that I want to deploy that are not inside the base image 
available within the Azure Gallery. So my goal is to not use a custom image, it's to use the base image from the Azure Gallery and then just use my other apps from the Content Delivery Network. I'm going to launch Notepad++. It brings down a small executable and when I launch it, because this is a brand new desktop, has never had any other application installed or launched on it, it's going to go through an initial setup that includes installing the agent for cloud paging, which is called the Cloud Paging Player. And then it's going to dynamically add the Notepad++ application and launch it. So Notepad++ has launched, we could see that. And it's fully functional. It's a fully functioning Notepad++. I could type in there. I could maybe open up some XML files or whatever file type I like. Maybe compare multiple files and just work with Notepad++. Now you can see if I launch the cloud paging player, the application it has already been added there. I could just right click and launch if I'd like to. And close out the application. And also it has added the shortcut to the start menu. So that's maybe the more familiar way that users would consume and launch into their applications. And I could just launch from here now. But Notepad++ is a very small, simple application. What about something that's larger and more complex? So let's go back into my CDN, and I've got my SQL Management Studio version 2016. And this app could be quite a struggle with AppV and some other older application delivery products. So if I go into the folder this time, you can see I've got this executable. I'm just opening it, running it as a regular user. And this time, it won't have to install the Cloud Paging Player because it's already there. It's just going to add the application in dynamically, and then it's going to launch it. Now, the launch performance of SQL Management Studio is just not very good in general, so it's still going to take a while to launch, but it has cached it and added it to the desktop pretty quickly, and it's launching. Okay, and at this point, I could log into a SQL server, but I don't have any on Azure, so I'm not going to do that. But with delivering these applications dynamically, not needing to put anything into the image, I can just use the out-of-the-box image from the Azure Gallery. I don't need to spin up any extra resources into my Azure resource groups. I'm just paying a consistent flat price for my cloud PC in Windows 365 and for my Numescent Cloud Paging CDN. How awesome is that? As awesome as that was, I think it could be better, right? I don't want my users to have to go to a portal and launch the application for the first time. So there is a new version of the product that should be available soon, and it does have a nicer, slicker-looking updated storefront, this one right here, and I could launch my Notepad++ just like I did from a web portal before, but maybe I don't want to do that. You know, people who use cloud paging server today on-prem would know that they have the ability to um, check a box to auto-deploy the application. But what if I want to auto-deploy an application to my Windows 365 desktop where maybe they're only using Azure Active Directory? Is that possible? It is. So you can have it if you go to the admin portal there's this storefront here, which is what you just saw. I published the application to launch from a web portal, but there's also this really cool workbenches feature. And I could add a bunch of different applications in, and I could assign it to single users within Azure AD, maybe traditional AD synced up, or I could assign it to a group of machines, to a group of users. And if I show you here, if I click add, this is my Azure Active Directory. These are my Azure Active Directory groups. And I could search for a group. I'll just search for my own user here. I've got multiple instances. But I will select the user that I want and just hit Publish. And then it will ask me to make a comment about these changes, so description. And this is very useful because you can actually roll back changes. So you can go to the revision history and roll something back to a previous state before a change. And once it's added to the workbench, 
if the agent has been deployed to the machine and I log in with that account that was just assigned, the desktop appears within the actual portal here. I can see the application assigned. I can view session details. And on that desktop, when the user logs in or at the refresh interval, they'll just have the desktop shortcut either in the start menu or the desktop and be able to launch the application. But there's also this really great cool feature called policies that I can add to any application or set of applications that lets me do things like uh, page the entire app set for optimal launching if it's maybe a particularly large application or also even set an expiration. If I want to deploy an application for just a set of days, I could do that too. So you still get the incredibly high rate of success and compatibility with applications that the core product already delivered, but with extra features that make it really awesome, particularly for those desktop as a service instances. In terms of application management, you get your modular integration with different identity providers, like my Azure Active Directory there that I showed. And there's actually much more. You probably noticed that during the demo, it's a confidential because it's a preview. It hasn't actually been launched yet. They offered me a sneak peek and actually showed it off to the cloud paging user group a couple of weeks ago. And they did give me permission to show it in my demo today. So, hey, you're getting an exclusive. I would bet I've only scratched the surface of what's coming in this new product. I don't work for Numescent, so I'm not up on absolutely everything that's going to be here, and I've only got to use this preview instance. But speaking of the cloud paging user group, if you'd like some free cloud paging training and this is of interest to you, uh, join our group by going to cloudpagingug.org and click on join and just join the group. You'll get access to our Slack workspace, which contains links, a private link to our part one of the cloud paging training. And we'll be doing part two of the training just before this airs. So you'll be able to get access to part one and part two of the training too, and also be included in any future meetings. And actually one topic that did come up during a cloud paging user group meeting was what percentage the various customers who joined the call were able to successfully deliver with cloud paging. And one of the customers who is deployed to over 80,000 users and a whole lot of applications said that they're actually able to deliver 100% of their applications with cloud paging. And that's been my experience too. It's one of the reasons why it's my favorite application delivery product. You know, I cut my teeth in MSI and AbbVie, but the thing was with MSI, if you made a mistake, that could have really horrible implications and break something on your machine or break another application or something like that. With AppV, you didn't have that many pitfalls, but you also couldn't get all of your applications to work. So a lot of people didn't like it. Same with ThinApp. You know, those were the big ones, AppV and ThinApp in terms of application virtualization, but you couldn't do all the apps. So people kind of shied away from it. Then there was also application layering products, which had a very high success rate if you're delivering or mounting the applications on boot or putting them in the image, but maybe not so much when you're delivering them dynamically. And then of course, as I said, MSIX, which you could deploy with MEM, could, that could potentially be really great in the future, but right now there's a very low success rate. Whereas with cloud paging, you have a huge success rate. And that's why I, I love the product so much. Just back to the slides really quickly to finish things off. If you aren't working with Windows 365, Azure Virtual Desktop, Citrix Cloud, or any other desktop as a service today, it may be worth thinking about what you would do if your CIO told you that you have like six months to move us to Windows 365 with Azure Active Directory only. When the business is buying new software, I would suggest that it's a good idea to vet the products with that in mind. You know, if it's a requirement to have a certain type of software, and that vendor does not support Azure Active Directory today, that's fine. I would maybe just keep a record of that so you have a list of the applications that you know are not going to be good candidates for that environment, and you may need to do something like use remote app or possibly Citrix virtual apps or Horizon apps or something like that to continue to support those applications in the event you want to move to a desktop that's running Azure AD only. 
It is a good time to also start reducing your dependence on dated practices like mapped network drives and overuse of things like file shares, plus bulky on-prem monolithic applications that have a lot of application servers, maybe clunky old databases, and that kind of thing that ties you to on-prem. My suggestion is to embrace software as a service. Embrace the agility that it brings. And you don't have to necessarily be in a position to switch overnight right away, but I think it's a good idea to prepare yourselves for what's coming in the future. Well, that's it for me in this session. I just want to remind you, I am doing that tech holiday giveaway and you can get more information at fivebytespodcast.com. There should be a link at the top if you're viewing this before December 31st, 2021. So enter to win a Raspberry Pi 4 and an Elgato Stream Deck. Just a quick word of thanks, obviously, to all of you for viewing this session. I would love any feedback that you can provide. If you've got any questions, just reach out to me. That's at Rory Mon on Twitter. Thank you to the organizers of this excellent event. Thank you to all the site supporters. And just have a terrific holidays. And I hope to see some of you at in-person events next year. Thank you.